Man did not park their stands a hole. All bells in paradise I heard them ring. Which is covered all over with the purple and pole. Man I love sweet Jesus above everything. Man in that hall there stands a bed. Hello. And welcome to the Black Country History Hunter. Today's story is a strange one and a very thrilling one. We all know the humble candle. And many years ago, this was made of tallow fat or animal fat. Now, many people in the mid 19th century would re rely on this for their light at night, in the dark nights and the dark days. But you would never guess that your life would depend on it. Now, in 1869, 13 men, 10 men, 3 boys, descended a black hole, a bit of a pit, pit 29, Locks Lane, on the Tuesday, 6 o'clock on the night they went down there, and they used candles stuck to their helmet to pit, to dig their pit or hew their coal. That night, little did they know, days later, they would be giving up light for life as they'd have to extinguish the candles and eat them as they were starving to death. The Nine Locks Cholera Disaster. Right guys, so just behind me, you can see the great Nine Locks. They run right down to the Nine Lock or the Tenth Lock pub. The Nine Locks are famous in the way that they, most of the stuff in the area is named after them, including this pit which the disaster happened. The Nine Locks works was just there. There was a galvanising works there. This is mid 19th century, 1850s, 1860s, very early. But the mine at the top was one of the Earl of Dudley's most precious mines. It, it had a lot of coal in it and they were digging a lot of coal up. Hence, he put a big engine there, one of the biggest engines in the district, if not the biggest engine in the district, which remained there until the 40s, I believe, working for Marsh and Baxter's. But this great engine, they called it, was not the only engine there. There was also an engine called the Trough Engine. If you look on the map, you can see the great engineer in pit 29 where the incident happened. We're on this day, the 10 men and three boys were starting their shift. The day shift had finished at six and they were going down to take over. Little did they know, they weren't going to be coming up for a whole week. Many people at the top believed them dead, and rightly so. Who can survive a week underground in them conditions? So they descended, three o'clock in the morning, the great engine engineer, the great pump, water pump engineer, noticed steam bursting. That great pump worked most of the district. It didn't just work that mine. So he noticed that there was steam coming up the shaft from the nine locks pit. So what did he do? He basically ran to tell the pit man and the wheel man that there was something wrong. They both then ran to the pit head, pit 29 head, and looked down, believing it to be a fire. It was late. That it could have been several things. It could have been that there'd been a great rush of water and that would have doubted the fire at the bottom of one of the pits. There's a great fire at the bottom of pits, the ventilation. It's a system that ventilates it. Before this, they would use little boys and girls to open and shut doors to allow ventilation. But now they'd use a great fire and this fire would circulate air by the you know suction and down draft and updraft. So, yeah, so they thought it might be that engine being put out or... It could be them themselves causing a fire. So what they'd often do is men down the pit. There's no communication. It's 600 foot underground, guys. That's Blackpool Tower. They'd have no communication with the top. So what they'd do is they'd set a fire of petroleum and light it in order to get the attention of the people at the top. There were bells and things to ring, but it didn't always work that way. So they thought it was one of them two things, petroleum or fire. They didn't actually think of the water thing. So, yeah, these two men, the banksman and the doggy, decided to do the brave thing. This is about three in the morning and descend the pit. Three strokes of that great engine and the men had descended 10 or 15 feet. It, the water was so far up the pit that they burst into it as soon as the engine was turned on. They realised they had to shout up. They shouted up quickly. The men, by the time they turned the engine back, they'd already nearly been drowned. They were brought back up. They realised it was water. Men were then sent out to fetch all the Earl of Dudley's agents, men who would look after the mines in the area. They were on the scene quite quick. <laughs> then the family were on the scene. What do we know? There's 30 souls under the ground, 600 foot under the ground. Water has come so far up the pit head that there's very little chance, if any, that they're alive. 
but the pit managers think different. They know that there are certain outcrops or outcrops in the area where the coal comes close to the surface where they are mining. And that's where the men were working. So there's every chance that the men are working and they don't even realise the water's in yet. And that was the case. The men were alive, but they were stuck. There had been an inrush of water the year before, but the water had managed to be drained away by the great pump and it had took three days to get rid of this water. So all the men in the area started hurrying towards getting rid of this water, guys. So they, they put all the pumps, they brought a pump onto site from off site. They started the trough pump, which is a pump that was for another old pit. They started the great pump. The pump, the great pump should work at five or six strokes, but it wasn't. It was working at nine. So it was really going, you know, powering. And in the end, with all things going, they were lifting 250 tons of water an hour from that pit, hoping upon hope that it was a recovery of men and not just dead bodies. But the men, carry on, lads. But the men who were down there, you can't imagine what they were going through. They were eating candles, guys. Can you imagine that? Actually having to eat candles. They boiled, you right, lads? They boiled the straps of their boots. They boiled the straps of their boots and they ate them. You know, one man wandered off but we'll talk about him later but yeah they, they went through hell i can't imagine what they went through they went through hell in this mine disaster guys they were down there from the tuesday night till the sunday morning and at whatever point they had to give up light i don't know but at some point they gave up that light in order to live and they ate the candles guys they ate the candles they had to the water they had to drink the one big killer was thirst and in the end one did die of thirst, Mr. Ashman. So thirst was a big killer, but they were drinking the wine water. I mean, this water here don't look too delicious, but if I was dying of thirst when I was in the army and I got thirsty, you drink, you drink what you have to drink to live. And I'm sure they drank worse than that in that pit. It would have been fetid, sewery water from the surrounding area, all different kinds of sewers leaking in, don't forget. This is just water from the top. This is rainwater that's washed down all the gullies from Marsh and Baxter's, from all the different works, you know, all these different chemicals. It was poisonous water. But they drank it and they lived. One man didn't, Mr. Ashman. He refused to. But yeah, so it was a tragedy. At the top, they believed them maybe to be alive, so they were really frantically trying to get the water out. By the Saturday morning, they were starting to make some progress. The water was lowering. They realised then, they thought by then it was going to be a body recovery. And the papers were reporting so. They were reporting it was going to be a recovery of bodies. So they were getting lower and lower. On the Sunday morning, it got to the point where they could take a gas lamp down and check. And they did. By the Sunday afternoon, they'd made contact with somebody on the far bank, deep under the ground, 600 feet down. They'd made contact and they realised they were alive all but one. All of the men got brought up, highly emaciated. They'd been eating coal as well. Highly emaciated, but alive is the key thing. That's just the strength of the, Brit of the British character, the English character, the idea that you can be put underground for that long. It's like the black hole of Calcutta, right here in the black country, you know? And it was a very, very sad thing. So the, the idea was, in the end, they didn't know where the water came from. You can see on this map, there's several mines in the area. The mines in the area are very, very uh, spread out, but underground they would be connected there wouldn't be much separating each mine and over time what happens is water builds up to the point where you can't actually dig too far left or right because you will inburst and then you'll get a massive inflow the year before there was an inflow of water and that wasn't a problem because nobody was down the pit at the time the year before the earl of dudley had made an inspection the year before this was a prize pit this is a pretty we're proud of he was sent there for inspections and so on but this in of water nobody was there if this incident had have happened on the day shift there could have been up to 90 men in there this was a big pit underground, miles of tunnels, old workings as well as new. So, yeah, they weren't sure where the water came from. But the men who went down there that day, some of them you may notice is a picture here. You can see the survivors. You know, some of them you might notice, some of them you won't. So I'll start from the top, which is Zachariah Pearson. He was 50 years old, Zachariah Pearson. We have George Skidmore. I know Skidmores. We all know Skidmores, I'm sure, in this area. A very common black country name. Thomas Hunt. 35. Sorry, George Gidmore was 21. He was only young. John Hanley. We know Hanleys. I know a few Hanleys. You know, is this a relative? John Hanley, 48. John Holden, 30. Did he give up the coal mining trade after this and then move on to beer? Who knows? Timothy Taylor, survived, 24. Benjamin Higgs, 47. Stephen Page, 26. David Hickman, 23. Thomas Timmins, 14 years old, guys. 14. 
William Ashman, 47. He died. He actually died. And then Thomas Sankey was 14 as well. But yeah, Pearson, it was 50. His son was working there. His son was 14. So we took him in as an apprentice sort of thing. Imagine being that mother, you know, letting your lad go down the pit so young. He would have been used to that because I'm sure that lad must have been down the pit younger than that. He must have been in the pit when he was five or six because the laws wouldn't have come in then. This might have been a hardened, this 14-year-old would have been a hardened pit man. But it's surprising. The man that died was much older than the kids and yet apparently he wandered off he lost his mind some say in the readings the cuttings i've been reading on the different statements at the court there was obviously in a court and that to look at why he died under there and why did they survive and he didn't that when he saw the water they'd finished working when they realized they was trapped so on the morning they were starting to come out for their finish of the shift six in the morning so six at night six in the morning 12 hours they were walking back to where they were going to get lifted up at the eye of the pit and they hit water and I'm like, oh, no, we're in trouble, you know. And at that point then, they knew they were trapped. Now, this gentleman who died, Ashman, apparently started crying. This would have been unsettling for the youngsters to see a grown man crying. Obviously, anybody faced with his maker, they must have knew that was the end. That was the end. That was it. There's very few people come out of a situation like that, guys. They knew they were being rescued because they said later on that they could hear the steam engines pumping. So they, could, they knew something was happening, but they couldn't see any distance in the water lowering. It would go down six inches and come back up 12. It was, it was fluctuating. Wherever this water was coming from, it was coming constant. Another thing that made me uh, smile was one of the gentlemen that come up, a Skidmore. A Skidmore. He said, um, when he came up, the first thing he was interested in, it wasn't, oh, I'm so glad to be alive. It was, he, he took note to ask somebody about a, a hair coursing or a dog hair coursing race, who was the winner. So he must have been gone in that day, knowing the race was going to happen. A week later, all he wanted to know was who won. But apparently he slept through most of it. He was one of them characters that could just, you know, live through any stressful position. These are the men that made Britain great, you know. A man who can sleep through potential death. He's a great man. He's a man who can set his mind, not lose his head in a crisis, you know. If you can keep your head when all those around you are losing theirs, the Battle of Omdurman, Waterloo, you know, great, these great characters, they're men who hold their nerve. They could be broken at any second and die, but they hold their nerve in the face of adversity. They are great men, and I believe this is what made Britain great and still makes Britain great. Do not think I've given up on Britain because I haven't. It still makes Britain great. These people are out there. The very early days of, of pit, pit mining where Mr. Pearson would have been working, up in the Broyle area, in the Black Country area, Mr. Pearson would have been working in pits where... There would have been wicker baskets to put the coal in and little girls and maybe his son at the time pulling those baskets. They were called putters. The men who hewed it were called hewers and putters. The putters would drag these baskets along the floor to the eye of the pit and then it would be picked up by a windlass. A windlass is basically like a gin. A gin, I'll put a picture on now. A horse gin in the early days. He would have been working with horse gins in the early days, Mr. Pearson. He's a man of 50 years old. He's still mining. He's seen it all, guys, you know. So these windlasses would have brought the coal up and the, the horses would have worked them. There would have been people on the top of the pit and the bottom of the pit. And this black gold they were bringing up, guys, it was it was black gold, wasn't it, really? You know, it, it's what kick-started the Industrial Revolution. It's all over the world. But it was right here in Great Britain where we decided to make it happen. We decided that this rock that was hot, that burnt hotter than wood, was worth doing something with. And we did something with it, all right. We built this amazing black country, this amazing country, this amazing empire. And this is just one testament to it, you know. This beautiful piece of elm, is it? Number two. This is number two. That's number one, I imagine. Three, following on down. But yeah, this is quite a feat of engineering. I'm going to take you up now to where the water actually came out that day. And then I'll take you to the site itself. It's a bit noisy, but we'll go up there and have a look anyway, guys. So, yeah, come with me. Right, guys, I'm just riding along now to the place where it used to come out. So, pit 29 is to our left behind the old factory, which was the Briley Lion Works. Or the Nine Locks Iron Works, sorry. Nine, nine, nine Locks Iron Works was there and the Briley Oil Works was to my left. See, so, yeah, just here. Can you see that pipe there? And that outlet there. The water's coming out. I did do a video recently where I went across there and I wondered what that was for. You know, I thought, why on earth would they have a drain coming through underneath a factory? 
It was there before, guys. It was the runoff from the great trough, which was the water-filled basin up at the top of the hill there next to the pit. Now, we'll go up there now and have a look at it. But, yeah, so all the water that day was drained into this canal, the Birmingham Canal. And on this map here, you can actually see that. that if you watch that red line, it runs across from the actual pit and from the actual pool down and then into the Birmingham Canal. So I'm sure that great pump would have been working to fill this canal as much as anything else. It was a, The reason this canal might have passed this way, yes, I know there was lots of ironworks, but the reason that pump was built there may have something to do with the fact that this needed water. I know there's other feeders, but the Birmingham Canal had the nine locks, and the nine locks were a great locks, and they needed a lot of water to feed them. So you killed two birds with one stone. You've got water from the mines, and it shows how great that pump is. In the 1918, I think, they basically turned it off after the end of the last great coal strike. Early Dudley packed it in. They turned that great, uh, great pump off. Within a few years, the water had rose so much in the local area. Mines like in Withermore were being affected, clay mines and, and things like that. So they had to turn it back on. You know, it, it just shows that how much water this beast was taking up from the ground. The canal didn't need feeding anymore by then. It was all trains, so they had no need for it. Then later on, there was another dispute with the uh, Marsh and Baxter's factory, which was using it for cooling water. I don't know if it was using it for its fridges and for sluicing, but they were using the water from the pump. For them purposes, they were using the pump. Without the Earl's permission, it went to court. I don't know. Right, guys, I'm on my way up to now to, where, to show you where it actually is, but I had to stop and show you this. I mean, you see that section of wall there? Now with all the uh, winters come and it's kind of died off, you can see that. You see all that wall there? That is original Birmingham Canal. Early 19th century, when the canal was first put in, that was an original feature. They would have used slag or cinders, ash, old bits of slag rock from the old foundry up there, round oak. Something interesting about this as well. This no factory there then. The factory started a bit further down. This was all train lines. There was a bit of a wharf there for unloading and loading. But there, there was a train line. And about three months after the incident, three months after the incident when the men survived and they came up alive, the Earl of Dudley came, wanted to visit. He wanted one of the men, all the men, the heroes of the scene, the heroes of the piece, which weren't incidentally the people who got captured down there. The men who tried to help him were all given gold watches. Now, the Earl of Dudley wanted them to come to Whitley Court and have these watches presented, you know, all big and posh. But one of, them, one of the guys there, Jeffries, who was the agent, he said, no, I want it presented in the mine where it happens, so fair play to him. So the Earl made a special day, he brought a load of people with him, including Mrs. Clawton, brought from, I believe, the school, Dudley Clawton School. 1869, just before Christmas, they come chuffing down here in an old train. The train would have been a really old engine, 1860s. Chuffing down this line, they visited the Round Oak Steelworks first, so he killed two birds with one stone. He went to the Steelworks and he watched some steel being hammered and stamped, which he was much impressed with. They wanted him to stop and watch more process, but he said, no, time's ticking, I've got to move on. So he moved on down the line, he pulled up somewhere here, he got together with his party, he was took to the pit on 100 metres that way, or that's where he got out, and he descended the pit. They were shown round, they were given a tour, they were shown where the water line came to, they were shown where the men were found, where Ashman was found dead, and told the story. Um... But very interesting. And then they went to one of the big caverns where all the stone, where all the coal had gone from. And they presented the watches. The Earl of Dudley made a speech along the lines of, you know, just praising the strength of the British character and the, the black countrymen in particular. Just praising how strong they was, like lions, you know. Here they are in this black hole of coal cutter and they survive. And I think we still keep a lot of them characteristics today, guys. We're still strong men. You know, we still, when we're given the chance, can roar. We're not given the chance very often these days, are we, because of uh, the way things are. But we will get our chance again, guys, to roar. I'm sure we will. But this wall here is a beautiful cinder wall. And it's original motorway of its day when we ruled the world, guys. Ruled Britannia. So this is it, guys. You know where I am. I'm up on the uh, the crossroads just down what is called now Mill Lane. But it used to be Locks Lane or Nine Locks Lane. It, I think Mill Lane started a bit further down the hill. Just behind me, we've got the Deluxe Decorated Centre and Zigzags play area for the kids. Now, actually, the main water pit engine, people say it's here on the car park, but actually it ran out to the corner of that path. So if we follow that down and meet it up, it was about a quarter way out into that road, the wall was, the, the front wall. 
if you look on this map here, you'll see what I mean. So the pit head for the water shaft was probably here where they've done some work. Don't know why they've done that work. But yeah, it was probably here somewhere. Maybe there was some sinking or something. I don't know, but it's bloody deep. It's a very, very deep shaft. Then the shaft itself, not, not the water shaft, the shaft 600, 600 foot shaft that they actually had the incident in is just here. So would have been just under that wall there, I believe. So yeah, the tragedy happened here. And this photo, which is contemporary, well, it's not a photo, it's a drawing, this contemporary drawing, you can see it was taken from about the pound stretcher area. And if you look here, you can see that picture. You can see the, the pit head and the mine, and you can see all the people in there as well, trying to survive it. <sighs> so yeah, they were here. this is it, guys. You know, right underneath our feet, all that tragedy happened, occurred. It's very sad that Mr. Ashton died. There were horses involved as well. I forgot to tell you that. There were six horses that would have drowned as well. The stabling was underneath the ground. That's where most of the stabling was in most mines. Once the horses took down, they never came up again. They never saw the light of day again. Some say they went blind, but I think that's a bit of a myth. There would have been candlelight and such down there, and there was no need for them to go blind. They were being led anyway, but yeah. They were let down, roped up, took down the pit head. There was no way to bring them up at night like they did the men. They probably could, but they wouldn't. They kept them down there, stabled them down there. Very sad, really. But uh, that was in place of little kids doing the job, you know, so there's a give and take, isn't it? I suppose better a horse down there than a little six-year-old girl. You know, a horse is more suited to the work. So, yeah, here it is, guys. I'll leave it there. The very sad story where they ate candles and coal. Candles and coal. Very sad. The nine locks pit disaster. It could have been worse. They all could have died, which is what they thought had happened, but they didn't. The, the saviours of the day got the gold watches. I think the gold watches may have been made at the Briley Hill Jewellers. They were inscribed and they had gold curb chains as well. I wonder if their watches are still out there. I think 10 or 12 were made and given out. And they had the name of the person, the date of the incident and so on. Who knows? If they're out there, let me know in the comments. I'd love to see one. We did have a book of receipts, but they were from 1890. So it's a few years before that. But yeah, the Earl of Dudley was okay in that sense. This is the Earl of Dudley here. But yeah. An amazing incident, an amazing place, and they all survived apart from Mr. Ashman. His body was taken over to the New Inn Talbot Hotel. There's a video on that if you want to watch it. It's up there. Great video. We had a look around there, and that's where his body was taken. And they found coal in his stomach, guys. Thanks for watching. Really hope you enjoyed this one, and I'll see you on the next one, guys. Really appreciate all your comments and all your help. The algorithm is going crazy now. People are starting to watch the video, so thank you, everybody that spared with me and carried on watching, because hopefully they're only going to get better and better. See you soon. All bells in paradise, I heard them ring. Bits gold on the outside and silver within.